I was having dinner with a friend not long ago in New York City. We met at a place called Oriol, which is in Midtown. My dinner companion that night was a senior advisor to BlackRock. As you may know, BlackRock is now the largest asset manager on the planet. It directly manages $5 trillion in assets, and it oversees another $11 trillion through its Aladdin platform. That means one firm controls more money than the GDPs of China, Russia, and Japan combined. Anyway, my dinner companion happens to work directly for BlackRock's CEO. As we nursed our white wine and the evening wore on, she let something slip. If I remember her words, she said something like, they want to tell us we can't sell. What was she talking about? Who was she talking about? I placed a few calls, first to my contacts in Washington, then to a few people on Wall Street. Soon I was on a plane for a series of meetings to London, to Geneva, back to New York, then down to South America. As I began connecting the dots, a pattern emerged. It revealed a network of more than 189 individuals positioned inside the world's major financial institutions. Some of them hold senior positions inside the IMF, World Bank, and every central bank in the G20, including our own Federal Reserve. These elites share one vision and they're about to make it a reality. That vision is one world order, one world taxation, and one world money. They've worked for years behind the scenes preparing to realize that vision. They've literally rigged the laws of international finance. Everything is basically in place right now, and there's essentially no way to stop this from happening. When the crisis hits, they'll flip the switch, freezing the global financial system. That will give them time to reset the world economy according to their vision. As the coming crisis unfolds, President Trump will be powerless to stop it. In fact, trying to stop them would probably weaken the president's power altogether. Oh, that, is, that, that, that is amazing, Jim, really. So what did these elites want from your contact at BlackRock? Basically, they want to classify BlackRock as too big to fail. The technical term is Systemically Important Financial Institution, or SIFI. That designation normally applies to banks, such as Bank of America. If your bank gets the SIFI label, it means the government will bail you out first in a crisis. But it also means you must turn over control of your bank until the crisis subsides. In this case, they're trying to reclassify BlackRock, an asset manager, as too big to fail. If they succeed, they'll be able to freeze BlackRock when the crisis hits. BlackRock clients won't be able to sell. They won't be able to buy either. Their accounts will go dark indefinitely. And the elite operatives will take control of BlackRock's assets remotely via the internet. But our research shows that their ICE-9 plan goes much, much deeper than that. Now, you refer to their plan as ICE-9. You just said that. What, what does that mean? It's a reference to the Kurt Vonnegut novel, Cat's Cradle. In the book, a mad scientist creates a new form of water molecule called ICE-9. When it comes in contact with other water molecules, it freezes them at room temperature. One drop of ICE-9 can freeze the whole ocean. And that's what these elite operatives are about to do to the world economy. Now, can you share with our viewers exactly who these operatives are and, and what their ultimate goal might be? Like I said, John, more than 189 elite agents have slowly wormed their way into leadership positions across the board. They now sit at or near the head of the IMF, the World Bank, and even our own Federal Reserve. They also control much of what happens at the central banks of China, Russia, India, Brazil, Canada, and Europe. As you know, these institutions form a kind of global superstructure. It forms a kind of snare net encircling all nations. Their leaders aren't democratically elected. They're not accountable to you and me. They're beyond the reach of government and citizens, and yet they hold the fate of the global financial system in their hands. To get a sense of how they operate, imagine an array of floating spheres. One sphere is labeled IMF, one is labeled Fed, one is labeled Bilderberg, one is labeled Wall Street, one is labeled Central Banks, one is labeled Intelligence Agencies, one is labeled Media, and so on. The elites inhabit all of these spheres, and together the network forms a kind of 3D Venn diagram. As I see it, regardless of what sphere they inhabit, the elites all share the same vision, one world order, one world taxation, and one world money. All of their actions are geared toward moving that agenda forward. Now, are, are you able to share the identities of these elites with our viewers? We've identified more than 189 individuals who are in many cases hiding in plain sight. Regardless, they all share the same vision, one world order, one world taxation, and one world money. A short list would include Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England, Raghuram G. Rajan, Vice Chairman of the Bank for International Settlements, Haruhiko Kuroda, Governor of the Bank of Japan, William C. Dudley, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Augustine Carstens, Governor of the Bank of Mexico, 
Janet Yellen, Chairman of the Board of the Federal Reserve System. Mario Draghi, President of the European Central Bank. Zhu Min, former Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. Zhou Xiuquan, Governor of the People's Bank of China. Robert E. Rubin, Chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. This A-list of central bankers and other elites is just the tip of the iceberg. Of course, not one of these elites will tell you outright what's going on, but I've seen and heard enough to connect the dots for myself. Not long ago, for example, I met with one of their senior operatives. He's a leading economist who served as the chairman of the Federal Reserve during the last crisis. He's considered one of the most influential minds in banking today. We met privately during a conclave in Seoul, South Korea. Of course, I'm talking about Ben Bernanke. I came away from my meeting with him stunned and convinced that ICE-9 was real. Not long before that, I set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with another member of the network. His name is Zhu Min, the former deputy governor of China's Central Bank. Until recently, he served as deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Zhu is a brilliant guy, like Bernanke, and he's pleasant and well-meaning. There's no doubt in my mind that he's also a member of the elite network preparing to impose ICE-9 on millions of Americans. But I wasn't done with my research. I have since met with dozens of senior officials, intelligence analysts, and former Wall Street colleagues. My quest led to a final meeting, a face-to-face -face summit with the head of Bilderberg. We met at Rockefeller Center in Manhattan, and he was very eager to get my take on the euro as a currency. I was happy to provide it, of course, in exchange for some valuable intelligence. As I say in my new book, he did not have horns. In fact, he gave me a nice gift when we parted ways, a blue Swedish vase. I keep it in my writing studio at my home in Connecticut. But my point is I came away from all three meetings convinced of one thing. When the next crisis hits, the elites are planning to freeze the financial system and they'll replace it with a new system, one not based on the U.S. dollar. When that happens, we'll wake up to a very strange and disturbing new reality. And, and for our viewers that are watching today, what might their reality look like that morning? How does this manifest? First, they'll have gone to bed knowing that a massive financial crisis was underway. But when they wake up, they'll find it has worsened and the contagion has spread worldwide. When they go to withdraw money, their ATM will say, close temporarily. When they go to sell stocks, their account will say, transaction not available. When they go to their local business, that business will only accept cash if it's open. As citizens realize they're being barred from their money, riots will erupt. It's going to get really bad really but, quickly. But how would such a freeze actually work? And, and wouldn't that be highly illegal? Well, it wouldn't be illegal technically because they've been quietly laying the groundwork for years. They rigged the financial laws, changed the rules of the game to allow this to happen. The stage is set. They have the levers in place. The lights are positioned. Now someone just needs to flick a switch and they'll impose ICE-9 rapidly. And again, all of this will be legal because they rigged the system in their favor. Here in the U.S., for example, Congress pushed through something called the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, or IEPA. This allows the government to freeze accounts, assets, even whole institutions at will. The only condition is that there's some threat to national security with a foreign connection. Of course, with a global market, every financial crisis has a foreign connection. Any systemic crisis fits the bill. And the thing is, when the next crisis hits, it's going to be so bad, President Trump won't have any choice but to go along with the elite's plan. Wow, that, that is, you have to admit, that sounds somewhat hard to believe. Now, how could these operatives actually freeze a whole country's financial system? Well, fortunately, we have some recent real life examples to study. The elites have been conducting a series of dry runs for years leading up to ICE-9. Look at Cyprus, for example. A few years ago, the Cypriot economy was in trouble, especially the banks. The IMF stepped in and loaned Cyprus $10 billion, but the loan came with strings. Now pay attention because this is precisely what they're going to do, but imagine it on a global scale. So in exchange for the capital injection, the IMF demanded control over the Cypriot banking system. More specifically, the IMF froze the entire system, literally every bank in the country. And they did that to ensure the IMF's demands were met, including strict capital controls. So how did all of this impact regular citizens? Their local ATMs went dark. Even the bank branches closed, permanently in some cases. Citizens could not withdraw cash. They couldn't even transfer funds from one account to the other. What came next? Wealth extraction on a grand scale. The IMF basically stole six to 10% of all the cash in the Cypriot bank accounts. How did the least justify this? They called it a levy, the price regular citizens had to pay for their government's missteps. Keep in mind, these asset confiscations were done at the balance sheet level with the institutions themselves. They never had to confiscate individual accounts. They froze every account by controlling a handful of the country's biggest banks. 
When the next crisis hits, we're going to see this here in the U.S. and around the world. And it'll be a highly coordinated global attack on the entire system simultaneously.